And let me tell you, I was convinced I was going to die. I had seen a guy drink, those things were called red cut. I had seen a guy drink the same thing in the streets. Red cut. I'd seen a guy drink two searches of red cut in the morning, he was not there. So I was sure four, four would finish my life. So I mixed them, held the empty sachets and I waited for him to come. My brother came back and I drank the concoction, tossed the things at him and told him, now bury me. This kind of thing that uh, you just drink poison and you collapse and die is a creation of the movies. It has nothing to do with real life. Because I, I drank and tossed those, you know, tossed the sachets dramatically and asked him, bury me. Because I expected to just collapse and die. And then, of course, they go and bury me and I would have gotten my wish. But nothing like that happened. The guy got angry. He ran back to the house. He came back with the cook and the, and the, and the, and the security guard. They came with a jug of milk. So we are fighting here. They are trying to get me to drink the milk. I bang the, the jug down. It breaks. During all this, I'm not feeling anything eh? during all of this. I, Kidogo, my brother gets angry and he really starts screaming at me. You know, he wants nothing ever to do with me and that kind of thing. And I can understand him. Because remember, 10 years you've never been home. You've just come home. You have built a bridge. And promptly you have burnt that bridge. And come to bring your drama into people's lives, people you rejected 10 years ago, and you know, you just come and start creating drama for them again. So he got really angry and he gave me a piece of his mind. Now in this confusion, but you are not dying. At this point you ask yourself whether you have drunk fake poison. Because you are not dead, but you are confused. So in the end, you know, I just took off and uh, ran up on a path that passes Kindaruma Road and went up to sides of Adam's Arcade. Now it's, it's darkish, so Adam's Arcade roundabout. You know, before there used to be a physical roundabout. It's not like nowadays. There was a physical roundabout there. I collapsed on that roundabout. But Next morning, I woke up. I know, I know my biggest regret was that I was alive. But then the excruciating pain that I was in, I knew this, if death means this much pain, I must say I want nothing to do with this death. I, I must seek help. I was dirty, I'd thrown up on myself, I'd soiled myself. But now at Adam's Arcade, there are some friends from days when I used to be uh, in Upper Hill School, days from my youth when we used to live in golf course. I have a lot of friends there in Woodley, uh, Adam's Arcade, Woodley, Apple. So just behind Winner's Chapel over there, there's a, a guy, a friend of mine called Joshua. And Joshua, they lived there for ages. I guessed that maybe they would still live there. So I got up, this is before six o'clock. So I got up, I half crawled, half walked. Behind up on my, from the roundabout, past the Uchumi, behind there, and to Kina Joshua's place. Watchman takes one look, bang on the gate. Watchman takes a look at me and tells me, Talk and I'm going That guy, no, but you go tell Joshua, as Solomon Kilanga, if he does not want to see me, I go. And I thank God for, and I thank Joshua for friendships formed in school because that. He did not, as soon as the watchman heard, I know his boss's name, Sierra Kaila Kumita. And this guy came and he helped me. I told him my story. He went, took me to their servants' quarters there. Uh, blacked out. He called another friend who was a doctor. We had also been in school together. And you know those guys didn't, want, didn't even involve police. I was treated in that servants' quarters of theirs for the next like three weeks. But at that point, you see also the other painful realization. I've just seen how my siblings have moved on. I have attempted suicide. I am the epitome of failure because even suicide I have failed. 
how much lower can you go in failure? Any person can stand on a stool and hang themselves. Yeah, you have failed even to kill yourself. Now the guys who have rescued you, who are helping you, are your former classmates. These guys weren't necessarily brighter than you. But now one is a lawyer. One is a doctor. You, their former classmate, you are a chokora. It is when it starts dawning on you. When you start figuring it out in your head. When that you are the primary victim of all your bad choices. That all those that you blamed did not suffer from your bad choices. That all the denial you gave over the years that you didn't have a problem doesn't help you. And at that point, you realize it is best to quit the denial. Stop the blame game kabisa. Accept and start looking into your own role in your tribulations. But the thing is this. At that point, nani atakusikia. So once I was okay, I went, they gave me some money, I went back to Isili, we promised that you would keep in touch me, I went back to Isili. Long story short, by, that was maybe my November, December of 1999, by, Janu, by December of 1999, I was back in the streets. So Christmas 99, I was in the streets, I was on a veranda. New Year, Yamwaka 2000, I was on a veranda. When guys were talking about the millennium bug and all that, those kind of things, I used to hear the chatter around me. But again, you could not even go to a newspaper stand because when it's your I was 34 years on 8th January, the year 2000. You're 34 years. You are living in the streets. Where when it's your Umejaribu kujiua umeshindwa na hiyo. You have no one and nowhere to turn to. You burnt all your bridges. There is nobody who would want to hear you. Life for you is over. So the only thing you can do is wait for death. In whatever form, it is going to come to you. And when I speak that story, part of my story, where I was there, I hope that it reaches the viewer out there. That no matter how bad and how broken you think you are, no matter how many millions of pieces your life has been shattered into, that little that is left is enough for God to work on and rebuild you completely. Maybe you are you have been shattered that much so that you can be rebuilt into the best version of yourself. For me, that is where I was at that point, 34 years old, broken, and with no hope for a future, with no hope for anything. In February of that, of that year, I stopped taking an active participation in my life. I stopped garbage collection. I stopped putting a sack on my back to go and collect the garbage. I went and slept at the, I went and slept up on the veranda, and when we were kicked off in the morning, I ended up kulala pale kwa karobu. If somebody bought or brought me something to eat, I ate. If somebody brought me something to drink, I drank. But I didn't very actively participate in my life because. I was hoping that then, through neglect of myself, death would find me. And when I was that broken, God, now I think so, something he could work with. Remember for me at that point, I had no concept or perception of God. And believe me, I would not have believed in any kind of God at that time. Because how would I have believed in a God at that time, going through that kind of life? But in retrospect, I realized maybe God had to break my arrogant little self that hard so that he could use me for what he wanted to use me for. So towards the middle of February, 
there's a guy we lived with on the street. School come out. <clears throat> and come out one day comes and tangas us to us. Limeokoka kuna Yesu. There is Jesus, I'm born again. You know, my first evangelist was a Chokora. He comes and tells me, he starts telling me about Jesus. He starts telling me about God. He starts telling me about, um, you know, how he's got and saved. And, you know, I'm looking at Kamau. And I'm well, first we almost beat him. You know, out of exasperation. Ujama, what was wrong with him? Can't he look at the reality of where he is? Where in this... Where can you, how can you conceptualize of a God who cares for you? Because here with your other guys, you are dying like flies and you're talking about God. And I kind of figured, in Bangi, because Kamau loved Bangi. And, uh, you know, when a guy has been smoking dope for too long, eh? I can maybe these were now just the signs he's going mad. So I didn't take him too seriously. But Kamau was insistent. By the way, come out, come every day. He talks to us about God. He tells us that he's met this pastor. Yeah, this pastor has talked to him about God. But slowly, slowly, there were subtle changes about come out. And we started, uh, myself, I started desiring these changes. But every time I talked to come out, he would tell me about going to meet this pastor. And where you put stories of Mungu Hapo, me, I wanted nothing to do with that. So, of course, the story comes back to square one. Because it's, come out, I'm looking, now I want what Kamau has. But Kamau is telling me, let's go to the pastor at Akuombea. Aye, for me, that's X. So we stop it at that. I looked at Kamau. I saw all the changes in him. I saw all the things he dumped. By the way, at Ayo Karobo, he stopped drinking. He was even cleaner. Kumba used to go to a place, bath, Nini, come back, John. He was even cleaner, looking healthier. He stopped Karubu, he stopped cigarettes, he stopped that. But one thing Kamo hadn't stopped was Bangi. And I knew as long as Kamo was still doing Bangi, the day he leaves Bangi, I'll believe there's something about what he's talking about. And one day Kamo left Bangi. I followed him like for three days. He's not smoking it secretly. Yes, I, I, I knew. I wanted to find out what Kamau had found. But the problem was still that story. Come, we go to a pastor, he'll pray. Ah, that story. Was. So we inganganad, we inganganad. Now I'm feeling so good that I'm doing this show in March. Because on March 26th, in a few days' time, will be exactly 22 years since the day I came off the street. <laughs> was on 26th March, 2000, 22 years ago, it was a Sunday, and Kamau came, Kamau came to me, I was in those Karobo bars. I remember I told you I wasn't taking an active participation in my life, but the night before a guy had left me something like 20 bob. So in the morning I had money for Karobo, for alcohol, so I was, Levy. by the time Kamau is coming at uh, 7.30 TV. He comes and tells me, but come, we go see the pastor today. On that day, I don't know why particularly, but I felt rage against all these things that Kamau was talking to me about. Maybe because I knew I couldn't attain them, I don't know. But I decided I would go with Kamau. Not to listen to what they have to say, but to put this pastor who talks to Kamau in his place so that he stops giving Kamau this nonsense na Kamau ache kutusumbua kwa karobu, we drink our drinks in peace without easy story. In fact, the, the drink I had, I gave my kasuku at the bar, I told them, hold this, I'm coming back. To kind of come out. So you get uh, to some place, Isili on Moratina Street there, and... Um, get into a gate there, and uh, when we walk in, <clears throat> first of all, the first thing I notice is there are some chokoras I knew from the streets. But these guys, it's a Sunday, these guys are here, they are wearing two suits. They are smart. You know, chokoras, when they, do, when they go missing, you don't really worry about them. Maybe they died, maybe they migrated to town or wherever, pastures were greener. I didn't know at that time that the man I was meeting was Bishop Absalom Dunko. Me, I just knew he was a pastor. 
as though he comes out. He's not impressive. Short man with a wild, very wide smile. And I start attacking him. I am very aggressive with him. I start asking him about this nonsense he's been giving Kamau. Why does he give Kamau this nonsense? Kamau will not leave us in peace. What is his lies he's telling Kamau? You know, I also want to irritate him because I want him to kick me out and I can show Kamau this just another human being that won't do, to undock. But this guy, he's calm. He's patient. He's, and all he keeps telling me is, God has a good plan for you. I run, I rave, he tells me, God has a good plan for you. Hey, what guys I seen this guy? Yeah, maybe he's, maybe he's going to an assembly. As we were talking now, I figured a place, I was tired of him just answering me like that. I looked at that, the Bible. At that time, I didn't consider it holy or anything. <clears throat> so I just told him, I don't want any more stories from you. Can you answer questions regarding my situation from that book of yours? That's why I advise Christians to know their Bible. Bishop knew his Bible. He picked up his Bible. Any question I asked him, he opened book, chapter, and verse and answered me directly. That this thing can answer you. You know, this is actually this is, this is answering you. At one point, I reached a, 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 a part. And I asked him, so can this God of yours take away my alcohol? And he says, yes. Hey, and I'm eager to know what I must do so that the alcohol can go. He's asking, what must I do? He tells me, Neil, I pray for you. I lost it. I lost it. I lost it. I wonder what is wrong with this guy. What, what, what simple tone does he take me for? What? How can simple prayers, how can simple prayers work? And he'll pray for me and alcohol will be God. I was so mad, I wanted to walk away. But then again, out of the corner of my eye, I had noticed. Uh, these chocolates I was telling you about who are smartly dressed, they were making some tea there. Hapa wana pika chai, ya maziwa. And I wonder wana paka blue, mkate blue band. Well, that is you don't get in the street. So I thought, why not hang around, at least I have breakfast, to compensate for the time these guys have wasted of mine. And so when they said, well, we pray for you, I said, okay, fine, let them pray. See, by then, that tea will be ready. So, uh, fine, I knelt down. They prayed, and they prayed, and they laid hands, and they spoke in tongues and what. And at one point, my knees were hurting one. I was even saying, I wanted to get up and go. But mercifully, the prayers ended. So you get up, and these guys start asking, hey, welcome to the kingdom, my brother. These are your these ex chukuras but they are now one again guys. So, hey, welcome to the kingdom, my brother. You wonder what kingdom? You feel zilt. I couldn't feel anything. But you want to be polite. So, okay. And of course, you want to drink the tea. So we had the tea, and uh, I wanted to go. But again, I'm mentioning these two things. They are tiny things, but they are things that happen. If they didn't happen, I would not be here. I would not be speaking with you. But there were tiny, minuscule things that you would not even have given notice. To Kidogo, when we finished the tea and I wanted to leave, one of those guys comes and tells me, Hey, tumekuchemshia maji ya kuoga. Hey, I hadn't bathed for long, but for how many years had I not bathed with hot water? And now somebody is offering me some hot water. Hey, I said, yes. So I was taken, but my clothes were taken. These, those ones went to be burnt there. And I was given bathing water and some new clothes. And whenever you hear me for the ministry I do, when I ask men to come and contribute their clothes, it's been 22 years. I've worn many clothes since then. But the, I was given a green, when I came out of that bathroom, I was given a green pair of slippers gray pair of trousers, a white shirt, which should have zilla as a cufflinks. Eh? Since there are no cufflinks, it just falls all over, over here. But I have never forgotten the feel of those clothes and the way they made me feel human. I don't know, because maybe, you know, in the river, you just bathe with cold water. Eh? You've had a hot bath, and then you come into these clothes. I just felt human. 
And I was feeling in a more affable mood and the bishop comes. I still think he's a pastor. He tells me, let's go to church. And I think he's been so good, so I'll go to church. I have asked these guys who are with him here, um, where, does this guy have, what, where does this guy preach? He has a church in Kayole. So I know if we go with him to Kayole, if we disagree, I'll come through those slums, I'll go to Soweto, then cut through those other slums of Sinai and ETC, come ombaying, ombaying, changao, the way back to Isini. So no problem. So uh, he gives me 20 bob, tells me to go shave. My hair was a bit long. I pocket the 20 bob and I decide. This is what I'll come back to drink, so I won't shave Sai. Kido, he comes, him and, uh, and his wife, uh, Mama John, she's called, she's called Mama, we called her Mama John. And we get in the car. We don't go to Kayole. Kidogo, me naona gari, metokea thika road. Kidogo, si asul, we are going to Kayole. Kidogo, there is passing Utali. They have bathed in hot water that day. I'm looking down to the river where I usually bathe, to Kapita. Hey, vehicle comes, it passes thicker. Now I'm getting a bit worried. Umsean and Peleka happy. All there till a place called Kabati. Turned off on the left, and then we get to a church. Um, <clears throat> and um, now is when I realize he is not just a pastor. Because I could see the way the people received him, the other pastors. I, you can see the, you know, the man in charge is here. And uh, so to Kapeleko and Dani, that's when I knew and I started hearing now him being referred to as bishop. So uh, we get into the church. He goes to sit at the front. Mimi na Peleko pale kwa raia. And uh, I, we, I watch the proceedings. Do you know my life? had become so abnormal that the abnormal seemed normal to me. Because when Bishop got up to speak, he spoke of a guy who had been through so much problems. In his own words, he said, he has come with a man who has been where the rubber meets the road. And then he proceeded to talk about a man going through so much problems. At one time, I almost looked around the church to see who else did he come with. Because me, I couldn't see that these are, these are my problems. Honestly, you've never had your problems explained by somebody else, but you start thinking, this can't be me. And then he called me to the front. <clears throat> and he tells me in Kikuyu, Heana Wira. That means uh, give a testimony. Now, first of all, I didn't know the testimony, so I asked him, you know. With, where now he is what, and he told me to give a testimony. And I was really, really mad. Because first of all, I was seeing, this guy has just been bad-mouthing me eh, to the whole church over here. He's just been telling them things I didn't even want to talk about. And then now he's expecting me to, 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 to stand here and collaborate his story. So I'm wondering, he's told me to speak. If I don't speak, and then he, he tells me, Bus, walk back to town. We are in Muranga, and I have only 20 bob in my pocket. I might not speak, this guy can dump me here. So I chose to speak, and my first testimony, my first ever, what I'm speaking to you right now, was coerced, forced out of me 22 years ago, otherwise I would not have been speaking here with you. Because when I sat there, when I took to speak there, I started realizing the, realizing the abnormality of my life. Like, for example, I st stood in front of the guys and I said, um, <clears throat> this morning, when I came out of my sack, and all these people opened their eyes and looked at me. And I realized they didn't come out of sacks, they came out of beds. There was an abnormality between my world and their world. But I spoke and somewhere in the middle of that of what I was speaking. For me, there are no drum rolls. Coming to God, there were no drum rolls or anything like that. In the middle of what I was speaking, I knew. I didn't suspect. 
I knew I would never touch alcohol again. And so we finished at Kabati, we left, and of course now coming back to town, the doubts are sailing me again. Hey, sasa ntaenda kulala barabarani, how will I manage not to, to sleep on the road without uh, something to drink? And eat. But by the time we got back to town, Bishop, kumbe what had happened is, as far back, this is the year 2000, as far back as the year 1996, he had been living in Isili. He's a, he's a bishop. He noticed the big amounts of men who are roaming, roaming around in the streets, living on dump sites and that kind of thing, and the fact that nobody wants anything to do with these men. And so, one day, he felt he's going to do something about it. And he just asked us, another street man, do you want God to change your life? Instead of a handout, the guy had asked for five shillings to go and eat, he asked him, do you want God to change your life? And the guy said yes. Bishop didn't hesitate. Next to his house, he had a small room where he used to do some silk screen printing. He took that guy without even bothering to notify his family first and followed all the Bible says. When you see the hungry, feed him. When you see the naked, clothe him. When you see the poor wanderer, provide him with shelter. Most guys cannot do the last part of provide with shelter. They may do the first two parts, feed, clothe, but are unable to do, they provide with shelter. He gave him first water to bathe, food to eat, a place to stay, a roof over his head, but more so he continuously gave him the word of God. Because where we are and in this work we do, we believe it is only God who can make you as whole as he originally meant for you to be. So he gave him the word of God. Within three months, this guy, the first guy was called Muturi. Within three months, Muturi, you could not believe he had been a Chokora. And that is how GLC, uh, the place that I run, that is how it started. I'm, I'm not the founder. This was started way back in 1996. I am actually a beneficiary but I now run it. The founder has since passed on. It's now in my hands. I now run it. But I'm also a beneficiary of the same. So from 1996, he brought in more men from the streets. He brought in men. He brought in men and others and others. And now, fast forward to the year 2000, that's how I came in. So I started living at the center. Uh, Kidogo... <clears throat> Kidogo, God started giving me back everything that uh, I, I had lost. Well, first of all, I started out hard. For me, I started by selling trinkets. I borrowed 500 shillings from him. I bought some to, 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 to chains and um, small mirrors and stuff like that. I started hawking, hawking those around. It was more to prove to myself that I could actually have 10 shillings in my pocket and not go to drink. One day I went, it had been in the center for about three months. And I read in the newspapers and I saw a guy that I knew. It's called James Gadaya. I saw his story in the newspaper. I saw it indicated where his offices were. He was handling some case somewhere. And so I went, he was in Hallingham, his office was in Hallingham. This guy we was classmates in high school. Now he's a big time lawyer. And I went to him and the first thing he asked me is, hey, Kilanga, where have you been, Bwana? You left the country. I told him the truth, but I didn't leave the country. Yeah, I was in the streets too. <clears throat> and we talked and this guy helped me. Uh, he built for me a catrolli. Smokies had just come out. So I started selling, you know, I've seen these two smokies and what, I started selling that. And a long story, I moved on. I moved on from there, Kidogo, uh, got some funding, started up a butchery. Afterwards, I quit the butchery. I decided I would go because I was helping the bishop also in this work of bringing other street men to the center. Those are I must tell you is living that life had showed me a life that no human being should live. I could not see how I could come out after living that life 
Somebody had given me a hand up. And then I just leave all those people who are there and who genuinely want to be helped out of that situation. So we were working with the bishop on this. But I was also doing my own things. Nijitegeme. Eventually, uh, one time I sold that uh, butchery business. And uh, as, as God would have it, it so happened that uh, uh, there was one preacher who had come and I was told to take him to preach in Kabati. The same Kabati where I first went and gave, gave my first testimony. I was told to take him to preach. This was an American preacher. And we are when we are living there, we start talking. He asked me whether I know about computers. I explained to him I know nothing about Remember, now this is the year 2001. I am 35 years old. I know nothing about computers. This is to Zilindipita Uko Gitambo. He tells me, come to my office tomorrow. He tells me where the office is. I turn up the next day. And this guy happens to be the owner of Diamond Systems. Diamond Systems in 2000, 2000 and something, Apple, was one of the biggest computer companies in this country. He hands me over to the managing director, tells him it's about October to one, tells him this guy, Mfunze computers, at the end of three months, give him a computer, Arudi Kaziake Kule Rehabilitation. This is God returning to you things. First day I walk in, I meet the guy who is assigned to teach me. <clears throat> I ask him, I'm fascinated. There's a ka arrow, a ka hourglass, this ka thing keeps on going round. Hey, I ask the guy, what's this? Guy looks at me and tells me, you don't know what this is. You'll never know anything about computers. Hey, okay, I think I thank him for those words. Because that fired me up to learn all I can about computers. Diamond Systems used to open at 6 in the morning, I used to turn up at 6 in the morning. It used to close at 9, I used to leave at 9 at night. By the end of the year, long story short, when guys were getting a bonus, I was also given a bonus and told to the next year I was given a job. Worked in Diamond Systems until uh, 2000 and 2002, uh, went on to head the technical department um, 2003, by 2003, I met a lady there in Diamond Systems. I had gotten, I married her in 2003, eventually left Diamond Systems, went, opened my own computer company in Thika, eventually got into partnership with some guys who were doing Mutumba. One of my partners who were doing computers with was in America. And he came across these guys, or was friends with these guys who are doing, uh, who are involved in the rugs industry. The rugs industry supplies maybe 85% of the stuff they pick to industrial, uh, for industrial rugs, but that 15% they supply as Mutumba here to Africa. We joined forces with those guys and uh, they brought Mutumba here. I challenged them to bring Mutumba here. We started selling in Uganda. Long story short, eventually that company I was there like their African representative. I was, I was head in six countries in, here in Africa. So God brought everything back. I had a car, I bought land, I a house, I had kids, I had a wife, I married in church. One thing I'm very proud about, I never had a committee for fundraising for a church marriage. I paid my own money for my own wedding. I'm so proud of that. But those, that's how God that is how God can elevate you. But here is a snag. This should have been a happy story. That's where it ends. Yes, and uh, things are great. But the problem was, when I came out of this, is the problem of addiction. Whatever you are fighting, if you do not deal with your underlying issues, the root cause of your drinking, you will remain in that vicious cycle of addiction. Because when I came out of the streets, remember I'd led a life so horrible that no human being should live that life. God had gotten me out. The first, when I came out, I first embraced religion. Not God, religion. 
Why I say I embraced religion is that I allowed myself to do certain things which the Bible does not advocate for. For, for example, forgiveness. For me, that wasn't part of the deal. I'll go to church, I'll clap, I'll dance, I'll tithe, I'll be a good Christian in other ways. But for me, the hate I have, the lack of forgiveness I have, there are some people who have wronged me, those ones I can't forgive. And so I kept my bitterness and some, all my issues, the baggage I had been carrying on certain issues, I kept them inside me. But because also I was a, I'm a man, and I equated success with money. The first few years of my life, getting out of the street, I had to make money. So you want to rebuild yourself. And I spent the first five or six years rebuilding myself. By the sixth year, I had everything. I had no time for negativity anywhere. You know, by the seventh year, when everything looked like all was back in place, Seven years after I came off the streets, I walked myself right back into a bath. And I drank like a person possessed. Let's just say those two years of my life are something I would rather just even not remember too much about. But two years later, uh, towards the end of 2009, I went back to this same, same center that I ran. And, and then it was under the bishop. <clears throat> I went back. And this time I decided I would find out what is my problem. Why do I drink? And I was able to sit and start introspecting my life thoroughly. And in that introspection, I was able to see certain things from angles of other people that I had not been able to see before. The only problem and my only regret is that by the time I came to my senses, my mother had long died and I could not go and make my apologies. So part of why I tell my story is to help people who are out there going through these things, to try to look at these issues, learn to see things from other people's perspectives. People could have done things that were meant to assist you and help you, you, you misread them, and they ended up, you perceived them wrongly, you ended up having problems just because of that. So let's go back. You've had my life from seven years going on, uh, and it's a pretty flashy life. At seven years, you're in consulata, you live in Westlands, uh, what is 87 Raptor Road today? It was a classy address then. It's still a classy address of where I lived. Uh, later on, you go to Nairobi Primary. Nairobi Primary in the 70s was a posh school. The chauffeur driven, the areas you live in, you look well. What does society see from that picture? Society looks and sees I, everything must be perfect there. Chauffeur driven kid, parents are wealthy, nini, nini, nini. But nobody's riding. Nobody's walking in the shoes of that individual, that child, me at that time. Because whatever society saw, and we still see that today, and if a kid goes wrong or gets into experiments with drugs or alcohol or something, we will all say, Kwa ni umtoto wako na nini? Umtoto amelipiwa fees, amepelekewa shule za maana, amefanywa, 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 parents. Money doesn't answer everything. So let me go back to my own story. My life is very nice from seven Kwendelea. At least what you hear of it. Let me go to zero to seven. I was born to a 14-year-old girl. My mother was 14 when she gave birth to me. She had just finished what was then called CAPE, Kenya Advanced Primary Education. She gave birth on January 8th. I think by January 16th or so, she had gone on to high school. I was brought up by my grandmother, and I knew my grandmother as my mother. To me, she was everything. To me, she was, she was my mother, my friend. She was, she was everything. My grandmother was not rich. 
she lived in a madhouse. We lived in a madhouse in the village. And, but the thing is, I think the first six years of my life must, were the happiest years of my life. I remember the muddy slopes we slid down when there was rain. I remember the uh, two little black beetles we chased in the rivers, the swimming we went, the, uh, the fairs, catapults we went shooting. But you know, it was, let me tell you something. A child who is loved, whose belly is full and they feel loved and accepted, they thrive. Kids don't know much about poverty, money, material things. It is adults who bring that nonsense into their world later on. For me, I felt loved. I was a thriving kid. Up to the age of, say, about six and a half, or going towards seven. Now, as I lived my life, remember my mother also was leaving hers. So she went to secondary, went up to Form 4. In those days, they came out and had like two or three jobs waiting for them. So she was not only bright, she was also beautiful. She joined East African Airways as an air hostess. And soon the girl who had been ridiculed for giving birth in the village at a young age was flying the world. And there is where she met Captain Abubakar Kilanga. Short time later, they decided they would get married. And when they decided they would get married, we were told about it in the village. And uh, I even have pictures. We attended, there was a nice wedding. We attended at the Old Mayfair Hotel. I have pictures of myself there at that wedding. <clears throat> but even at that wedding, I had no connection to these people. I did not know this was my mom. To me, my grandmother was my mother. So around just before getting to seven years, <clears throat> uh, they come back. This is after the wedding. Maybe they had gone for a honeymoon or whatever. But they come back. Then one day I'm called and I'm told, uh, this is your mother. Same day I'm told you are going to live with her. So take any almost seven-year-old kid and forcefully uproot them from where they love and know is home and give them to what they consider a total stranger. You have ruined something in that kid. There was no preparation or nothing. So if I start tracing my problems back, probably they may have started somewhere around there. This is a kid from the village. I had never spoken a word of English. Even if we had had a word of English in the village, they would probably have translated to my mother, thank you. So this is a kid from the village. There is not even an albino in the village, so you have never come across anything that is different from your color. And you are suddenly thrust into Westlands among a white neighborhood. You see the white kids, eh? and the way they are playing, they are having fun, king of the castle, you cannot join them because of your limitations. You cannot express yourself to them. You can't communicate with them. So you just sit at the back, look at them, and wish you were back in the village. You miss your playmates. You miss those guys you went to the river with. You miss those guys you fired catapults in the village with. And you start to resent the person who has brought you here. That is my, my, my biological mother. Abu Bakr Kilanga, her husband, was Muslim. One of the first things was to be taken to Mpisha and circumcised. Those, that's not the tradition back in my home, so now I'm experiencing different, uh, different traditions. As soon as I was healed, it was Consolata Primary. Now this famed Consolata I keep on talking about, I went there without knowing English. There's a whole lot of difference between going to Consolata when you're, when you're a fluid English speaker and going there as a person who doesn't even know the English language. First of all, now, Konso was also, this is the early 70s, <coughs> Consolata was also primarily a white school. So you are thrust into this. You stand out. 
two main reasons. One, you're black. Unaonekana from far, you are different. So that makes you stand out. But two and the more obvious one is that you're a Zuzu. You can't communicate. So people will come to probe and poke this thing down and talk. Does it, if you push it, does it? You know, kids are bullies. You can't communicate. So you are bullied until you are... Whatever, whatever comes out of you, because whatever will come out of you is kikuyu, to, 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 to the wazungus, this is garbage. What is this? this is, um, you know, so they poke you, they prod you, they what. And you have a teacher guiding you around there, but you really, all you feel is a lack of self-esteem. Here in Westlands when I came, this is the first place I ever saw a house with a man dedicated to cook. You know, in the village, we just ate what was put in front of us. Sometimes you washed your hands, sometimes you didn't wash your hands. It was okay. But now here, I have found a man dedicated to cooking. That was my first cook that I ever saw. But now, it's, all that is exciting. But fact is, you are too unrefined to be sat on the grand table there with a the new husband. So you sit in the kitchen with the houseboy, uh, with the cook and the maid, and you are taught... You are there being taught to use a knife, a fork, how to fold your cutlery, stuff like how to arrange your cutlery, how to fold your linen and all that. And all you feel is like you're an animal being taught to perform tricks because where do you eat with your hands? Ulikufa. So I was a, conf a kid with too much confusion, but too, my self-esteem was completely battered. And uh, I think... The only escape part I had Kidogo was when in 1977 the East African community broke up. Tanzanians, Ugandans were kicked out of the country, so my parents relocated to Tanzania and I was taken to Nairobi Primary for boarding. Now, Nairobi Primary was a very posh school, but coming from Consolata, okay, so they are, you know, you feel, eh, now you're in charge of Kiasi and uh, you start, but deep in you, you still feel uh, unworthy, you still feel inferior, you still don't have much self-worth. And so, when in Standard 7, it was at the same school, we got that opportunity to drink. Remember me telling you what I felt the first time? And then asking you, why would a 13-year-old kid feel so empty? that they would need a drug or alcohol to make them, to make them feel good about themselves. So now you know. That was the reason why. When at the end of time I dealt with my issues and I could look at things through my mother's eyes, all that resentment I had had, you see, that's actually a very small thing but had been blown out of proportion. I had blown it out of proportion in my own mind. Because first of all, if my mother, for example, at the age of 14 when she gave birth, if she had chosen to stay in the village, would have ended up two village idiots. But in her wisdom, she decided to go to school so that she can search for a future for her bastard child in the village. That was a very commendable move. I should have been full of praise for that. Instead, I considered it abandonment. And when she finished school and went on to become an air hostess, she did not even do that job for a very long time. She instead chose to terminate that job and marry Abubakar Kilanga. A man, because they later divorced, a man who maybe she didn't even love. But the fact of the matter is, he was the only man who would give her child, would adopt her child, give him a name, he gave me an expensive education, he gave me the exposure that has enabled me to thrive in certain aspects of my life. So everything she did, she did for me, not against me. When I think that I was taken to Consolata and thrown in there with Wazungu kids just so I could be tested, it is foolish thinking. And the fact is, if I didn't go there and learn it and learn in Consolata, 
I probably would not be able to communicate the way I communicate in English. So that was a blessing. I thank my mother for it. It was just too bad that by the time she passed on, I had never yet come to my senses on these things. That's why I talk to people, so that they can get a chance to make amends with those that they may be thinking have done wrong against them or to seek for the help that is necessary. Now, that story owes me now to what I do. Because of those experiences, immediately I started working with the bishop. Then later on, I went, I went seven years later, I went back to Kakunwa. Remember, first of all, in these seven years, I was actively bringing in guys from the streets and we would help them with the bishop. In all those years, the center was at Isili. And then uh, in 2018, Bishop Dungo passed on. And uh, after he passed on, even me had said, ah, not the only Chokora left uh, who came out of the street. So I also abandoned the project. We left it to uh, his son, uh, John. John ran the project for some time, but John is a pastor, a very good pastor. But this wasn't his calling. And later on, he came and told me he would close it around 2019. So I thought, fine, we'll continue with it. And I uh, got friends around uh, to support these friends. I've brought in their networks. This is a ministry that is not, uh, we don't, we're not funded by donors. We're not funded by any formal organization. Most people who work at our place are volunteers. But our main thing is to go out onto the streets, bring those men who are willing and stuck in addictions off the streets into the rehab center. We have a four-stage process, which is rescue, physical removal from the street, to rehabilitation, which is primarily done through the word of God, three, Reconciliation. Remember that these people, they didn't fall from trees, as I said in the beginning. We try to reconcile them with their people. But if that doesn't happen, then uh, we go to the final stage, which is reintegration. Reintegration involves, we keep them at our place. We have a halfway house system where guys go to work. To not have to kazi za mjengo. But even kazi ya mjengo, when a guy goes, if he's earning 600 shillings a day, then we allow him use of 100 shillings because he's eating and sleeping at the center. 500 shillings he will save. 40 days of working, that guy can have saved 20,000 shillings. Now with that 20,000 shillings, we buy him a starter kit, uh, bed, a mattress, uh, some so, two, three souvenirs, two cups, nini, a starter kit, and move him to his own house. In our area there, Houses are, uh, small rooms are like 2,000 bob a month. So the 20,000 is enough for him to go out, start life as a normal contributing and productive citizen of this land from being a Chokora. Over the years, uh, we have about 2,000 guys who have graduated through the program. But we want to be able to expand this program. This thing of alcoholism, drug use, and the boy child in Kenya. We are going to either continue to bury our heads in the sand, and one day it will have serious repercussions on us. The street man that we will continue to ignore and hope he goes away and continue to stigmatize him. Remember potentially, potentially, I use this word carefully, He's the most dangerous, even among those street families. Because this is a man, he has nothing to lose, and society will continue to hold him in that kind of contempt, making him a potential danger. But these are our brothers. We can reach out, we can help them. The greatest lesson I learned on, on uh, involving addiction, involving addiction was that fact that if you don't deal with your underlying issues, you will forever be stuck in a vicious cycle of addiction, rehab, addiction, rehab, addiction, rehab, addiction, rehab, 
that vicious cycle till your dying days until you are ready to face what is the actual issue that makes you go into this drinking then you are never going to because you can remove the alcohol for a temporary time and the rehabilitation ukaya is sita there is no alcohol around when you come out and whatever because it's all up here whatever was bothering you up here returns you will go back to the thing that eases the pain for you so about addiction that's the biggest thing i've learned um what keeps me going a friend you know i said the first thing is i live that life i was an arrogant kid i was a person who maybe like many kenyans i didn't understand this community of the street people so when you when you when you come across this kind of things uh well you 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 i want to continue because i believe i am not saying that every man living in the street is willing to come out law i said this before in our normal human society see there are thieves there are looters there are rapists there are what in our normal society so the same even in the street community okay wale unasikia they will watashika kinyeshi watupie watu watu angeta nini those the misfits are there just like they are there in the normal society but there are people there who went down there whether through their own fault whether through other circumstances but right now all they are begging for is a hand up out of that life and i will always be ready to give them that hand up because somebody gave me the same i pray in what i am trying to do right now is to see whether we can have the same kind of setup of glc replicated in several parts of this country so that it starts dealing with the alcohol problem the street and the street men problems and i'm very intent to leave an impact the time i leave i want to see a lot more of those men in better positions and we can see the results we have a lot more of them who are speaking out we go to churches we speak to them we try to demystify this uh we are not just about uh, having that uh, rescue center in 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 roiro i also go out to schools i have been to a lot of boys schools just to speak because the problem is as men we we keep our pain to ourselves we don't let it out that's the way we've been parented when one woman one woman ali agi nini shut up suck it up you're a man you shouldn't cry we we grow up like that and then when we are under pain and pressure we cannot let it out and eventually the pressure busts and we find ourselves with all this abuse of alcohol abuse of drugs and nina nini i am trying to talk to get men spaces where they can sit as men and talk even at GLC I, uh, if you visit there you find there's a place where men just sit men from the outside men who are going through the program just sit and share so anybody who would like to assist us we kindly we oh, please uh, come join us first of all visit that that is the best thing for us you can do if you are within roiro you are within nairobi visit we are just on the eastern bypass if you want to partner with us for us to uh, help bring solutions to our to this problem we have a pay bill number through which you can uh, contribute to us the pay bill number is 891300 pay bill number 891300 the account number is glc glc you could call me uh on 0715 874094 for any inquiry and um you could if you have a group of young men or you have a place you would like uh, somebody to come and speak to people you care about who might be losing it who might be going down that path we have we have a team which goes out and tries to make a difference all of us tungane mikono this is our wound collectively let us be the solutions provider to this problem of ours